Monday marked the 16th anniversary of the worst terrorist act in American history when hijacked aircraft were flown into the World Train Center and the Pentagon while another was crashed in Western Pennsylvania. Yesterday, Oliver caught up with some of the Moppus High faculty and staff to talk about their memories associated with 9-11. At Fried Hardeman University in Henderson, Tennessee, um, I was on the way to an 8 a.m. biology class when the first plane hit the tower. This happened. I was actually teaching school at uh, Hamilton High School. Um, I was in my classroom and had a teacher from across the hall who was uh, actually on their planning period and was watching the news and came over to Haley and turned the TV on with uh, what's happening. In New York, so that's where I was at. I was teaching school. Um, I actually was a student here at Demopolis High School in Coach Sprinkle's room, if I can remember correctly. I was here at the school in my classroom. I was in my classroom. I was a brand new teacher, um, and uh, one of my students came in and was like, "You know, they tried to blow up the Trade Center," and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like in the '90s." And I thought he was trying to get me off topic. And then another teacher came by and was like, why aren't you watching the news? And the boy said, I tried to tell you and you wouldn't listen. I remember being stunned more than anything because you had the two planes that hit the World Trade Center. You had another plane that hit the Pentagon. Uh, the reports of a fourth plane that was headed for something um, that crashed in western Pennsylvania um, and the whole thing kind of played out it was like watching a Tom Clancy novel play out that was sort of my thought process at the time um, and we didn't know what it was and why it was happening um, it was the most uncertain feeling that I had felt at that point at 19 years old uh, I think you know like a lot of people you know just uncertainty not knowing what was actually what was happening to begin with and then um, once everybody kind of figured out what was going on then figuring out what was going to be next so um, just uh, you know a lot of uncertainty uh, not only that day but in the in the days and weeks following. Um, I remember being really confused I didn't know what they were talking about at first um, it wasn't until about fourth or fifth period when I got in coach Watson's room we started watching all the news and we sat up there and watched everything that kind of it dawned on me like oh my god like we just had a terrorist attack it was hard to believe that this was happening in our country um, it was really quite scary well uh you know 8 45 in the morning the time of the first strike i was right at the end of first period and uh when the news came out that it had happened you know, nobody really knew what to think. Nobody knew what to believe. Uh, of course, we started watching CNN and, and NBC and the different news outlets, and uh, it was really just unbelievable that this was happening to us uh, here in the United States. It's been profound. Um, I think for a lot of people uh, in this generation, students at this school, they it's hard for them to really be aware of how different the world is now than it was before 9-11. Um, the Department of Homeland Security didn't exist before 9-11. Things like the Patriot Act didn't exist before 9-11. The word terrorism wasn't part of our vernacular. It wasn't part of mainstream culture. We weren't aware of, of its existence largely. Um, but now, you know, you see all sorts of things happen uh, and, and your first thought is, is this an act of terrorism? And, uh, and so that's part of the public consciousness in a way that it never was before. And I think it's had some really profound impacts on uh, the way we identify as a nation and the way we identify with certain things. Well, I mean, it obviously has changed, uh, you know, it changed a lot of people's lives that day. It changed the, the course of our country uh, politically. And, uh, where we were going. I mean, we've been in a, what, a 17 year war in, uh, in Afghanistan and uh, had a war in Iraq. And so, it, you know, not only did it change uh, that day, but it changed uh, you know, the course of our country, not only the course of our country, but the course of a lot of other countries as well. Um, probably would be our patriotism. 
because that kind of woke us up and you know brought us back to what it truly means to be you know a United States citizen. A lot of people are fighting for our rights here. A lot of people are here, um, you know, trying to get away from those third world countries. So I think it just kind of reminded us how important it is to be here in the United States. Um, I think in some ways it's made, it made us more patriotic uh, in general, not just right after, but uh, even in the years since then. And I think it also made us much more scared got us out of our comfort zone. I think we've been comfortable for a really long time. I believe that 9-11 has made us stronger as a country, but it is also, it is also um, shown that we have our vulnerabilities and, uh, and uh, we, we do have things to be concerned about here. Homecoming celebrations begin Monday here at Demopolis High School. As part of the festivities, students are invited to participate in dress up days. The Demopolis High Cheerleaders have announced the themes for each day. Here's Erica Riggs to tell us more. Homecoming is just around the corner, and here are some examples of what you will see on the dress up days. Here is Hunter Bailey. Hunter, how should students choose to express themselves? Everybody's like either doing like mermaid or something like under the sea for like dressing as a fish or a mermaid or something. I just feel like the seniors will be gone in a few months and stuff and we're all going our separate ways. So I feel like this is our last homecoming. So we really need to take advantage of it. Here today I have Savannah Williams and she's here to represent your sophomore class as Halloween. So Savannah, what does Halloween mean to you? I think Halloween's so fun. I think my favorite part is all the churches get together and they have their fall festivals and it's not a huge thing, it's not like a church service, but everybody just gets together and just has a lot of fun. And today I'm here with Malik Moore and Ashley Ivory. So Ashley Ivory, what does this homecoming selection mean to you? Um, it means a lot with the session of we got one of the best things, holiday things for Christmas and Christmas. It's not so hard to dress up as, but I think all the other classes got easy things, not us, but our class is going to do big and I hope to see everyone dressing up throughout the week. A little week more, what do you, your family or friends do on Christmas? Um, well, normally we host Christmas at my house, uh, my entire family. On my mom's side, they come down and they eat and we play games and just laugh and enjoy each other's company. Demopolis High School prematurely lost one of its own with the sudden death of Jason Donald, a member of the graduating class of 2019. This week's spotlight shines on a little-known initiative here at Demopolis High that is designed to honor Jason's memory. How exactly did Jason's closet come about? Jason passed away in July and his mother came to see me the first part of August just before school started and she wanted to donate Jason's school supplies to a student, to a student in need. And she asked me to come up with a student, and I thought and thought and prayed. Just couldn't come up with any one student that we could help. There were so many. And so, um, after talking to some other teachers and, and trying to get some ideas, trying to find the perfect student for Jason's school supplies, somebody suggested Jason's closet so we could serve more students than just one. So I mentioned it to Miss Marchand and she thought on it for a little while and prayed about it and she came back and said she was all ready to start Jason's closet. How exactly have donations came in to help the to make sure that the closet keeps going? Well the initial donation was of course made by Jason's mother Miss Marchand and his brother Jeremy and they came in and they set the closet up and they had, had everything like they wanted it, the baskets and the buckets and, and all of the supplies. And um, that was at the beginning of last school year. And then about midway through the school year, she came in and brought some more supplies to make sure we had plenty. And then just before school started this year, I started just receiving boxes from Amazon Prime and Walmart.com where people had heard about Jason's Closet and started to just donate. 
So I would just get this random box of supplies. I think there were um, some people from a church that, that heard about it and wanted to contribute. And so um, I've had several shipments from anonymous donors that have come in to make sure that we had plenty of supplies for any students that need it. How exactly do you think that Jason's memory will live on through the closet, or do you expect it to? Well, I do, and, and you know, it was so hard to try to come up with that one person because these were Jason's school supplies, which made it so special and so important. And so by being able to open this up for anybody that needs anything, then um, Jason's memory lives on that that everybody gets to use Jason's school supplies. And um, our librarian came in and she made, um, she wrote a poem and, and posted some pictures of, of Jason so that we were able to make sure that the students knew why Jason's closet was started. There's a lot going on around campus. Allie Busby and Braden Harris are here with Tiger Now School News with everything you need to know. The CDA and education and training classes need help with their homecoming float. Please submit the name of one of your teachers that you feel should be honored based on the impact they have made on you. Submission should be turned into Ms. Tupperville in room D10 by tomorrow, September 15th. The PSAT test is set for Wednesday on October 11th. Here at Demopolis High School for the sophomores and juniors who would like a jump start on their National Merit Scholarship. The test costs $16 for sophomores and is free for juniors. The deadline to sign up for the test is Friday, September 15th. Congratulations to the 2017-2018 FBLA officers. Your president is Anna K. Williams, Vice President Michaela Durden, Secretary Emmy Weiss, Treasury Taylor Vail, Historian Shelby Gandy, Parliamentarian Mackenzie Deal, Social Media Chair Tori Horn, Public Relations Sydney Lindsay, 10th Grade Representative Michael Osmer, and the 9th Grade Representative is Abby Hathcock. The Demopolis High School Boys and Girls Basketball Program will host an alumni basketball game Saturday, September 23rd in the gym. Registration forms are due by September 21st. The game will feature former boys and girls players from Demopolis High School. Doors open at 2.30 p.m. Admission is $5. FBLA is working with the Big B Humane Society to host a dog food drive where the class that brings the most dog food in their fourth period class by Wednesday, September 27th will win a pizza party on Friday, September 29th. The Demopolis High School Beta Club has announced its, uh, its officers for their 2017-2018 school year. Congratulations to Sarah Duncan Culpepper, President, Sarah McVeigh, Vice President, Shelby Gandy, Treasurer, Savannah Williams, Secretary, Madison Phillips, Reporter, Savannah Horshock, Chaplain. Ninth and 10th graders, if you are interested in trying out for the Scholars Bowl, please see Ms. Batwell for details. There are flyers available in Ms. Pearson's office for those who are interested in competing in the Miss Alabama pageant on September 23, 2017. Community in Action and Townsend Automotive are partnering to encourage students to take the pledge. Students who pledge to not drink any form of beer, wine, or other alcoholic beverage during Homecoming Week are entered into a raffle to win a ride in the Homecoming Parade provided by Townsend Automotive. Raffle tickets are available from SGA representative. Anchor Club membership forms are available in the front office for pickup. Students from Westside and U.S. Jones who had perfect attendance for the first month of school were presented on the field Friday night. Here they are taking the field. Westside kids, please take the field. <laughs> The cheerleaders also offered a cheer camp to students at Westside and U.S. Jones. They too were presented Friday night before the game.
That's all for this edition of Tiger Now School News. Did you know Demopolis is now 200 years old? This weekend is the bicentennial celebration here in the City of the People. DCS Tiger TV's middle school broadcasting team now gives you a closer look. Here's Molly Catherine at the McDowell Edmonds House. I'm here at the McDowell Edmonds House, built in 1844 by Alexander K. Marshall McDowell. For whom McDowell's Landing was named, this house originally sat in the middle of the block and faced north. Cotton and Kitty Edmonds have purchased this house in 1996 and have done extensive renovations. Here's Emily at the Lockwood House. The Lockwood House, named after its architect Frank Lockwood, was built in 1921 by Morris and Carrie Simpson Stern. The Simpson Stern family were prominent Jewish merchants in the Demopolis community. Frank Lockwood was a distinguished Alabama architect, most noticeable for public works including the renovation of the Alabama State Capitol building in the early 1900s. John and Nancy Northcutt purchased the house in spring of 1990. Now here is Sarah at Ash Cottage. The Gothic Revival style at Ash Cottage was built in 1858 by Dr. Sinatus Ash. The house was moved from its original site on North Strawberry Avenue. It was moved to its present location and renovated by Mr. and Mrs. Joseph C. Turner. Don't forget to come out to the Bicentennial. Happy 200th birthday to my team is off to a strong start under new head coach Brian Seymour. But what makes him an effective coach and teacher? DCS Tiger TV's Malik Moore is here with Coach Seymour to find out in this week's Coffee Talk. Thank you Coach Seymour for being uh, here with us today. We just want to learn a little bit about you. Where are you from? Um, I'm originally from Dallas County, uh, which is about an hour from here. Um, I grew up in Pineville, up in the states in the country. Um, uh, I enjoyed the outdoors, hunting, fishing, and uh, my dad was a coach, so I was running a lot of athletics. We had two other brothers, and um, but uh, you know, I enjoyed it. So you said you grew up. Your dad was a coach. Did you play any other sport besides football? Oh, yeah, unfortunately, I played everything. Played everything. Yeah, I, 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 I thought like when I was growing up, I pretty much me and my two brothers we had a ball in our hand at all times. You know, we go to the football season, we throw in the football, and if not basketball season, we're shooting basketball, and baseball season the same way, and any, anything in between, from, you know, eyes and ears, ping pong, whatever, whatever, whatever's going on with golf. Very competitive, too. Yeah, just very competitive, just grew up very competitive, and, you know, that's just, I guess, being, you know, raised by a coach, you, you grow up to be competitive, and compete hard against your brothers, and you be your buddies down the street, you know, they went down the street for us, it was a long way off, but, you know, it was very competitive growing up. I assume you took that competitive nature into the classroom as well. So what got you into teaching? I guess, well, I, I, you know, to start off with, I guess that, that was the avenue to coach. You know, I was kind of following my dad's footsteps and uh, wanted to be a coach. And uh, like I said, and then, and yeah, I knew you had to have you know, get a degree in teaching. You had to teach something to be a coach. You know, but, you know, you find out how much, you know, it's very similar. You know, the, the classroom is as a chance for me to go out there and, and interact with people, meet people because the size of players out there and players and coaches that come in contact each day is opportunity to meet the student body, and I, I really enjoy it. So was seeing your dad coach, is that what got you into coaching, or did you have a different, like, uh, incentive or kind of motivation for coaching? I, to be honest with you, I, I did follow my dad's footsteps, but, you know, I'd be honest, he kind of discouraged it. He, yeah. He, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be around athletics. Cause yeah. I grew up around it, you know, and he, he really tried to push me towards more towards sports medicine, you know, rehab, therapy, stuff like that. And uh, but as I got to school and started taking classes, I knew it, and he was coaching, so I would go back as much as I could. I would try to help him on the side. and. You know, so I kind of told him, I thought, hey, it's what I want to do. And he, he, he said, hey, you sure? You know, he's, so he was kind of this because, you know, I'll be honest with you, it's a strain, it's a strain on, on the, the family because, you know, you, you spend a lot of quality time uh, up here to make sure, you, you know, doing things the right way. And you got to invest a lot of time if you want to be successful. And I think he was concerned about the family life. But, I, you know, blessed to have a good family that, that supports me in, in, in this, in this uh, profession. And like I said, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's tough to juggle, you know, teaching, coaching, and family, but uh, we make it work. Okay, so you already said it was like difficult balancing coaching and teaching. Um, so what do you think men can gain 
from football? Like, what do you think is the lesson to gain from football? You know, I, I just think, of course, everybody wants to be competitive. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to be successful. But I think it's those times that, that, that we're not so successful. When we, we make mistakes, we fall short, we face adversity. I think those are life lessons. You know, and I think and understanding that, that there's going to be adversity in life. And you, you, it's, you're going to face times that it ain't so easy. And things not always going to go your way. And you got to learn to the people around you. And it's a support system between, you know, the players and the coaches. And like I said, and then, of course, it's family. You trust, you, you trust the people around you. You, you grow to, you know, build those relationships. I think that's, that's very positive in the, in the future because we go out in the workforce, we're going to be competing for that job. You go, you go out there, there may be you know, eight or nine people competing for the same job. you got to find something that makes you different from that next person. And I think that's very, very important. And I think that's what sports does. I think it builds character. I think it builds integrity. I think it builds those qualities you need to be successful in life. Yes, sir. Coach Seymour, thank you for your time and good luck this week. From Leto to Leo, Tori Horn, and this week's Pop Culture Talk have the full rundown on the behind the scenes talks that will bring to life one of DC Comics' favorite villains. Hey y'all, it's Tori, and this is the Pop Culture Talk. The Joker is one of the most iconic villains of all time. He's been portrayed by actors like Jack Nicholson, Mark Hamill, Heath Ledger, and Jared Leto, just to name a few. Because Leonardo DiCaprio be added to that list, Jared Leto made his debut as the Joker in the 2016 film Suicide Squad, and is yet to return to the role. But it looks like he won't be returning for the Joker's origin film. Warner Brothers wants to break away from the existing DC Extended Universe and its current Joker, Jared Leto, for the origin story. The movie will be set in the 1980s and is said to be a gritty realistic crime drama. So, will Leo make a great Joker? That's for you to decide. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week on the Pop Culture Talk.